What's happening, y'all? Welcome inside the Fantasy Stock Exchange. Danny and Bush coming at you today with a one quarterback dynasty startup PPR mock draft. We usually talk super flex on this channel. We figured we'd mix it up a little bit and do a mock draft in a one quarterback dynasty startup format. We know that a lot of you guys out there don't play super flex. So uh, this is for you guys that uh, are in the one quarterback format. We are currently doing this mock draft with members of our discord. We're not recording this live. Obviously we're just doing it ahead of time and putting it on the channel after. But if you guys want a chance to be in things like this, when we throw a link into the chat and be featured in a video, you can join the discord right now. It's totally free to do so. You just have to hit the link in the description. So Danny, how are you doing today? Doing well. And yeah, you guys love this, mo these mock drafts get you guys involved, get you guys drafting. And uh, yeah, it's fun for us. We usually do Dynasty Superflex mock drafts. We're spicing it up today. We're going to try out the one quarterback round from all of you, for all of you one quarterback plebs. I'm just joking out there. Uh, to get the full experience of the channel, again, you guys showed a lot of feedback on the one quarterback rookie mock draft. So let's take it to the next level and do a startup with it. Right. So we're, once this fills up, we're going to hit the intro and then we're going to get right into this. All right, now we're going to be randomizing the order. We're going to be getting right into this thing. And Danny, hit that randomize button. I'm pretty sure I know where I'm going to be picking. Oh, oh wow. Six overall. Let's go. Got, I'm finally got, picking ahead of Danny in a draft. I got 12. <laughs> For sure. So I'm going to start this. Oh, uh, wrong button. And we're going to begin the draft. And bada bing, bada boom, 30 second clock. So we see Christian McCaffrey and Dalvin Cook go off the board first and second overall. This is a dynasty mock draft. So I'm not sure how high I'd be taking Dalvin Cook in that situation. I probably would have went with a younger running back like Barkley or, or Taylor potentially over a guy like Dalvin Cook. But in a, two, in a super flex format, of course, if you guys do play super flex, you know that by this point in the draft, we're at the 104, there'd probably be two or three quarterbacks off the board already. And in a one quarterback format, you definitely see the quarterback position devalued in a dynasty format. It's still a little bit more valuable than it would be in a redraft, but it's it's definitely more devalued. And I'm going to go with my uh, dynasty running back four overall. I'm going to go with Cam Akers right here because I, I know there's probably some of you out there that are like, how the hell could you pass on Derrick Henry or Nick Chubb for that? I think Cam Akers is going to be a certified superstar this year for fantasy purposes. And before anyone's like, oh, but you're losing all the equity if you draft him there. No, I'm not. He could be the 102 next year. So I'm not yeah. losing any equity in that regard. Yeah, and what people fail to realize is he doesn't need to finish as the sixth overall running back this year to return higher than sixth overall value. Because remember, we're talking about Dynasty. We're talking about a 21-year-old running back who is going to perform this year, first of all. Second of all, we're looking at it from the aspect that we want appreciating assets. And let me tell you, at the running back position, there are not many better appreciating assets than Cam Akers. So uh, after you go with Cam Akers, we do see an appreciating asset himself in Justin Jefferson go off the board, followed by Tyree Kill, both of our wide receiver ones, and Nick Chubb. So I'm about to pick in three. We got Breddy and Judoyo picking before me. So we'll see what happens. Right. And Nick Chubb was the guy I was caught between, between him and Akers. That was the direction I was going to go. But we always talk about, you know, providing flexibility at the top of your draft with a guy like Cam Akers, who I believe can be a top five running back this year, who's 22 years old. I have the flexibility to, you know, transition into a rebuild strategy if I want to. If my second round pick falls to me and it's a younger asset, like the guy you just put on the screen there, DeAndre Swift, if he falls to me in the second round or a guy like JK Dobbins falls to me, I can go with more of a rebuilding type of strategy that as opposed to if I went with Nick Chubb, I'd be kind of pigeonholed into going with uh, win now assets. Yeah, for sure. So uh, <laughs> it's actually funny that you said he might fall to you because I was actually contemplating him taking him here because I know for sure Gibson's going to be my one pick. So that's why I'm kind of taking the clock here. Um, my next pick would come down to between Swift and Harris. And I think I'm going to spice it up. I'm going to go Swift here. So I'm going to go Gibson first. And then I'm also going to go with DeAndre Swift. Yeah. See, to me, I just can't do that with DeAndre Swift. That's as much right. as I like DeAndre Swift, I think he's like well below those other guys in terms of even if I wanted to go for a more uh, win now asset or a rebuilding asset, I would much rather have a guy like Najee Harris or J.K. Dobbins or Clyde Edwards Hilaire mm -hmm. even too, a guy like DeAndre mm -hmm. Swift, who I just I don't believe his situation is going to get that much better this quickly. Oh. You always want to bet on the talent in Dynasty. Nobody knows what's going to happen. We know that DeAndre Swift's an uber-talented player, but if he sees a role that is more so a pass-catching running back role, not necessarily a feature back role this year, 
his value isn't going to plummet, but it's not going to increase much. And I think with a guy like Dobbins or Harris, we have much more appreciating value potential this and year. That's where I kind of am a little bit divided there. I, I do disagree because we have seen, even from the coaching tendencies of both Lynn and Campbell, while they haven't really necessarily used their receiving back as a full on featured workhorse, as much as we love Kamara, he's not a featured workhorse. As much as we loved Eckler in the past couple of years, he hasn't been a featured workhorse. The way these they use these running backs in the passing game, we're talking about this was tweeted out, uh, I believe, by PFF Nathan Janke, but. Austin Eckler and Alvin Kamara are tied in the last three years of plays of or receiving plays of 15 plus yards down the field at 36 apiece. They're tied for first. Now we're getting both aspects of that coaching staff really uniting on the Lions. And quite frankly, I'll go again. DeAndre Swift, is he right now the type of receiver that Kamara or Eckler is? Maybe not, but he's a damn fine receiving talent. I think this is a guy who has 75 reception capability, in all honesty. And if that's the case, I understand maybe it's a less than optimal situation year one because, again, we don't expect this team to score a lot of points. But in terms of receiving output, in terms of the offensive line that they're building, because I've looked at that offensive line, man. The Lions have a really solid offensive line that they're building over there with Decker, Ragnow, and now Penny Sewell added to that right tackle position. So um, I think 2022 and on, DeAndre Swift is going to be a locked-in top eight overall running back. So if I'm getting him here with the youth, with the appreciating asset uh, mindset of it with Gibson, I'm fine with going that young turn there with Gibson and Swift. Right. And I was actually debating between two more so win now running backs between Zeke Elliott and Austin Eckler there. I went with Austin Eckler. He's got a bit more of the youth on his side, a little bit PPR. more of a... Yeah. And it's a PPR. It's, it's a full PPR yeah. uh, mock draft that we're doing here. So I still, in my opinion, have a lot of flexibility to go with more young assets, go with, you know, potentially more aging assets. Given the fact that I have acres and Eckler who should both be top 10 running backs in fantasy this year. I, I really like how I started my draft off. I did consider Calvin Ridley though at wide receiver, because in my opinion, I think he's a tier break. I, I know CD lamb went right after me. I would not pick CD lamb over Calvin Ridley. There's no way I could do that personally, as much as I think CD lamb's a great player and a, a fine prospect still. I don't think his two to three year range of outcomes is close to what Calvin Ridley's is. Yeah, it's definitely fair. Again, I think they're they're kind of a similar tier, but again, Calvin Ridley right now has a case to be the wide receiver one in redraft in 2021 and probably 2022 as well. I mean, you're talking about a guy in that situation, high volume passing offense, the official number one weapon. Again, people are always going to cite the splits of him with and without Julio Jones, but guys, Take into the context that they've added fucking Kyle Pitts to that situation. We're not just talking about uh, apples to apples comparison here without Julio Jones. I'll be, I still think Calvin Ridley is etched in, quite frankly, as a top six overall redraft wide receiver with a guy who has that number one overall upside. I know you mentioned it in your league winning wide receiver show, but Calvin Ridley's got all the upside out of the wazoo. Of course, Lumber has to snipe me there. That's who I was going to pick. Yeah. I was going to go with ETN there. Um, to me, at running back, it's a little bit uh, murky right now. I wouldn't go with a guy like Joe Mixon or Josh Jacobs or Miles Sanders here. Javante Williams would actually be my next ranked running back, but I actually am going to go over to the wide receiver position where I think the hate has gone a little too far on Michael Thomas. I uh, I view in a full PPR, again, we're playing in a full PPR format. In a full PPR format, Michael Thomas has the highest reception upside of anyone in the NFL. We've already seen it. He broke the receptions record uh, two years ago. And I know he doesn't have Drew Brees as his quarterback anymore, but Jameis Winston is more than capable of feeding Michael Thomas 110 receptions this year. Yep, for sure. And again, we're still talking about a receiver that's 27 years old. He's still going to have, and the type of receiver that he is too, we're talking about a guy that could play well into his 30s because he's not a, a deep threat receiver that needs speed or athleticism. He's more of a physical beat you up at the line of scrimmage receiver that could play you know, into his 30s the way that we've seen from Larry Fitzgerald, for example. Yeah, no, 100%. I mean, we're talking about Michael Thomas. He is automatic when it comes to the slot situation. That passing the offense is going to be uh, just as fine this year. We saw the splits even with and without Breeze. And MT, the main difference I talked about in the ranking show was the touchdowns. And in general, we're talking about an alpha number one wide receiver with the versatility of Michael Thomas. He's going to be that number one weapon in that passing offense. So overall, you're looking at the situation outside of Michael Thomas. Who's really going to feed targets there? You're talking about Traquan Smith. You're talking about... Uh, Who's our is it Adam Troutman? Troutman? Like, yeah. no, it's it's going to be the MT and Camara show as we've been used to seeing at this point. Right. And the offense, I don't think the offense is going to change at all, to be honest. Whether it's Taysom Hill, whether it's Jameis Winston as the quarterback, whoever they go with is going to operate a similar offense to Breeze. Obviously, if Taysom Hill is the quarterback, they'll probably be more designed QB runs and stuff like that. But even still, I, I think Winston's going to be the QB. It's going to be the Camara and Michael Thomas show. You're 
happy as shit because I know exactly I, who you wanted. Javante with that Williams pick. and Jamar Chase locked yeah. and loaded. Not even, not even a second guess. Not even a second thought right there. Listen, uh, I'm building a young team, and my three running backs to build around are Gibson, Swift, Javante Williams, and I can etch in Jamar Chase as my wide receiver one. I am fucking stoked about this start. Right, and I have more. So we we went with a little bit differing philosophies, right? You have a young team that maybe it's going to be probably moderately competitive this year, but is not going to win the championship necessarily. I have two guys that I believe are going to be top 10 running backs. Both have top five upside. In my opinion, I have a wide receiver, especially in a PPR format that can absolutely finish as the number one overall wide receiver. We've seen him do it before. So I'm going to be looking to go, uh, to go towards more of a win now type of frame and mindset, because I have a, a, a team that can absolutely compete. And there's a guy that I absolutely want to fall to me right now. And I cannot believe that Darren Waller is still on the board. If Uh, he gets to me, I am going to not. There's no way I can pass on him at this point if he gets to me. But I probably just jinx it, to be honest. By the way, the only other person I would have considered if I didn't get Javante and Jamar Chase there would have been Kyle Pitts. So I'm shocked to see that Kyle Pitts is still on the board in all honesty. So I think Uh, both tight ends should be gone by now. Both Waller and Pitts should be gone. Absolutely. I mean, we're talking about tier one assets and this guy's got a young team in front of me. So he might go with Pitts over Waller if he were to pick a tight end. I don't know if he's going to do that, but uh, I don't think he's going to pick Waller. And again, I might jinx it here, but um, I think Waller is going to get to me on the way back here. Yeah. Oh, he went Pitts. Pitts. I I called it. I called it. Kyle Pitts, he had a young team and he's doing exactly what you want to do, right? He has Justin Jefferson, J.K. Dobbins, Chris Godwin. Both of all those guys are young players and Godwin especially might have more value this time next year than he does now because he might go to a new team like the Colts or something, sign a mega contract and be the number one receiver there. And then at that point, he's going to be an elite asset. So to me, Darren Waller is absolutely too good to pass up here. Him, Kittle, and Kelsey to me are all within a few picks of each other in terms of like my startup rankings. So the fact that I got... Darren Waller, 16 picks after George Kittle, who I view, and Travis Kelsey, who I view in a very similar tier, is, is just smashing value, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. I fully agree there. So we got Lumber back on the clock here, and he's got a youngish team as well. You got Barkley, Lamb, and ETN. So overall, I mean, yeah, well, again, you lock in your quarterback. You got a young team around it. I don't mind that. Again, Josh Allen's a guy who, outside of Mahomes and maybe a couple other quarterbacks, is one of the only real assets in fantasy football that you can say confidently will last 10, 15 years. So early quarterback in general, one quarterback is a little sketchy, but if you're locking in a guy like Josh Allen in the fourth round, I think that's pretty appropriate value. Right. And I think that when you're talking about early quarterback in general, right, we, among with a a lot of the fantasy community will urge people to wait on quarterback. I think more than ever this year, I think it's more, you know, plausible to do so. And especially in a dynasty format where all these top guys are still young as we're seeing them fly off the board right now with Mahomes and Allen and Murray and and Prescott and Lamar, they're all very young still. And I think we were talking about this pre-show, but I don't see a world where any of these guys finish outside the top 10 because of the rushing ability that they all provide. It's going to be very difficult. And I know we don't want to look at range of outcomes and absolutes. Like obviously any of them could get injured or something like that, but these dudes all seem to be very safe because of the rushing ability that they have. And, And for most of these guys, they have elite passing ability as well with Prescott and Mahomes and Josh Allen. I think people are really underrating that that first tier of quarterbacks, how ahead of the pack they actually are. Yeah, absolutely. And I know exactly who you're going to get here next. If he falls to me, he's absolutely going to be going, like that. He's going to fall to you. There's, he, there's two guys that I actually want a lot right now. Yeah, I know. Who the one, who's the one that you're talking Lamar about? Lamar Jackson. Okay, so one of them's behind me and the other one's Lamar Jackson. Mike That's Evans fair. would be the other guy that I would really want to fall to me here because I, Ooh, I that'd I, be I, nice too. Can you can you believe that Mike Evans is one year older than Calvin Ridley? He's one year older than him. Yeah, that's He's, all. Ah, there, there, there it is. He knew it. He knew it was coming too. Okay, so on the board right now, wide receiver, I'd be considering a guy like Kenny Galladay, maybe Devonte Smith if I wanted to go young. But I have a pretty. Um, Pretty, pretty win now type team. So yeah. I am going to go with Lamar Jackson here. I think he's the last of a huge tier break at quarterback for me. Like I just said, I think these, these top, you know, six or seven quarterbacks in a super flex format and a one quarterback format are ahead of the pack. So in a super flex format, if I don't get these guys in the first two rounds, I'm waiting till the fourth round to take a quarterback. And in a one quarterback format, if I wouldn't get these guys between rounds three and seven or three and six, whenever they're going, I would wait until the the double digit rounds and grab some of these rookie quarterbacks like Justin Fields or something like that, or go after even a Ryan Tannehill or a Russell Wilson in the seventh, eighth round. Yeah, fully. Again, in my situation, as we see an auto pick, James Robinson, that's sad. Um, 
But I, in my situation here, because those top guys are gone, now I can just pivot. I'm stocking up these mid-round receivers. Talk about attacking that wide receiver position in the mid-rounds. This is the type of team you do with. I'm looking at right here, like Devonta Smith, Jerry Judy, Chase Claypool. If I can pair two of those guys on the turn, I am absolutely stoked. Right. And I'm looking at some of the other teams here because I have a win now team. I got to look at my opponents, right? Who else kind of went win now? And I can see this, this first team, uh, big boy flay looks like he's got a win now team with the two running backs and Kittle and Herbert and Ayuk. It looks like, uh, the second overall pick here, Dalvin cook, Travis Kelsey, Mahomes, Keenan Allen, Chris Carson. This guy's really embracing the win now, uh, mindset. And I think if you're going to do something like that, if you're going to go either for a rebuild or for a win now situation, you want to look at your, your league mates and see how many people are going for it all. Cause you can always pivot, right? If we're three rounds into this draft and I see that everybody's just soaking up youth, nobody's trying to win right away. Then I can really hammer those aging veterans and, and look to snag a championship or two early on in the, in the dynasty league. For sure. Um, I'm caught here between Judy and Claypool. Usually I'll go Claypool, but because it's a full PPR, let's experiment. I'll, I'll get Jerry Judy on this one. Yeah. So I'm looking at a young team, like very young. <laughs> not a single person like I think Jerry Judy is my oldest pick and he's what um how, how do I see the how do I see the card fuck okay whatever he's probably uh, 23 years old yeah Tw 22 years old 22 years old <laughs> like everybody's 22 years old on my team so they, right. they, they're, they're you there you go yeah, exactly. And the best way that you can, you know, attack your other positions, tight end quarterback and stuff like that is to go for youth as well. Right. Because like I said, these, these top tier quarterbacks, if you're not going to get one of these, just stack youth, man, at, at this point in the dynasty league, grab, if you're trying to compete, grab a veteran that you can use like Tannehill or even Tom Brady or something late in your draft and stack them with a Zach Wilson or a Justin Fields or Trey Lance or something of that nature, because it should be very easy for you to, uh, to pivot to your young quarterback after your aging quarterback starts to decline. And in a one quarterback format, the um, dynasty league is, is very easy to navigate the quarterback landscape. It's not like a super flex where people are going to hoard quarterbacks and try and trade them and stuff in a one quarterback league. Everybody's got a good quarterback. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. So as we see, speaking of quarterbacks, uh, everybody wants to get their quarterbacks now after that fourth and fifth round run, we see Burrow and Wilson go off the board and in a one quarterback format. That's just a little premature on both of them, in my opinion. Um, again, there's so much receiver talent that I, I couldn't fathom going with a tier three, tier two ish type quarterback over again. You mentioned a Kenny Galladay, uh, talk about other receivers, Chase Claypool, Jalen Waddle. There's just so much good receiving talent that I wouldn't pass on for them. Right. And speaking of good talent, that's a tier break. I think Kareem Hunt is a huge tier break at running back here. I, I, I think that's a phenomenal pick. I, Kareem Hunt. Yeah. He's going to be stuck behind Nick Chubb for the next year or two, but this guy's still a young running back. There's a We all know his upside this season. If Nick Chubb, anything happens to him, he's going to have a huge workload like we saw last season. But Kareem Hunt can still go on to another team after this year and and you know uh, fetch a contract and I could sell him at that point or I could uh, hold on to him and let him produce into his, uh, into his late 20s. But he's a guy that doesn't have a lot of tread on the tires, obviously, because of his off-the-field situation. So I, I really like that pick at 6-7. Yeah, no, 100%. I mean, you're talking about Hunt and Claypool. They're back-to-back. -back. I think both of those are phenomenal picks. And yeah, given you're a more win-now squad, getting Hunt as your RB3 with that core that you have, that, that's going to be one of the top teams in the league this year if we were to make this into a real league, hypothetically. Right. And you talked about, I, some, a couple people are talking about in the chat too, is people are like, oh, this ain't a super flex. Why are the QBs going so far? The way I, I'll just talk about my own mind frame when I picked Lamar Jackson. Who is going to help my team more? And again, in a one quarterback league, this you know, it still holds weight. Is Lamar Jackson going to help my team more than, than miles Gaskin or Cooper cup or Devonte Smith yeah. this year? Yes, he absolutely, absolutely is. He's enough of an advantage at the position that he is going to help my team more than those players. If I'm talking about Lamar Jackson versus Allen Robinson or Amari Cooper or Darren Waller or Keenan Allen or Javante Williams or miles Sanders, then it's a little bit more of a murky question in a one quarterback format. Mm -hmm. The question that I have, though, is <clears throat> I'm fine with those first six guys. It's just once you get into the Lawrence Wilson Burrow area, that's where I'm like too early for me. Like, right. They, At that point, what is really the difference in a one cornerback uh, quarterback format between Joe Burrow and Justin Fields and, you know, and Trey Lance? Like it's probably less than the difference between the running backs and wide receivers in that range. Like in a one QB, for example, we're looking at Lawrence at that 508. You could have had, looking at it because it's a younger team, let's just say hypothetically, you could have had Devonta Smith, you could have had Jerry Judy, you could have had Jalen Waddle, Claypool. Like those are all guys in a one quarterback format that I would prefer over just locking in Trevor Lawrence as good as Lawrence is as a prospect, as a player. 
Right. And another like thought process thing that I want to really, you know, hit home about is when you're a win now team, as my team has been assembled and you just took, you just saw who I just picked when you're in a win now format, don't be afraid to also mix in youth, right? Just because you're a win now team doesn't mean you pass on youth. It means that your philosophy is to acquire talent that can help you right away. But at the same time, you don't want to hamstring yourself in the future. I don't want to take Adam Thielen over Rashad Bateman just because I'm a win now team. I want to take Rashad Bateman and then pair him with a, a veteran later in the draft so that when that veteran's time is up, Rashad Bateman should be in his prime and he should be able to produce for me uh, at that point. So you also want to have a, a clean mix of players too. You don't want to just go all youth or all veterans. Yeah, 100%. Again, like for, for me, I do like mo mostly aligning my peaks together, but every now and then you're going to get a falling value like Bateman and in a one quarterback league going at the 706 is like, why would I pass on him in this situation? And I don't, I don't view Rashad Bateman and Devontae Smith all that differently. And, Rashad, and Devontae Smith went at the 512 to you. So to me, that yeah. is a big time uh, value gap. I would take Bateman after Smith. I'd probably take him, you know, six or seven picks after. But at this point, we're 15, 20 picks after where he went. So I think that's a good value for me on Bateman, who's a guy that I'm very high on. Yep, absolutely. So I'm about to be on the clock here and I can kind of go through my rationale. So I'm looking at maybe like a LaVisca Chenault. Uh, and Elijah Moore here. Uh, personally, I would go with uh, Colin Sun. He did get, just get taken. I'm actually going to go with Chenault and Moore back to back here. Lock down that young receiving core. We're talking about a receiving core of Jamar Chase, Devonta Smith, Jerry Judy, Lavisca Chenault, and Elijah Moore. Right. <laughs> and if I were you, just because looking at the tight end landscape, I would have peeped the tight ends just because I see a huge tier break at tight end, which is Dallas, Dallas. Goddard. Yeah. And I one. would, and he's still a young player, obviously too. Um, and there's a good chance in my opinion that he gets re-signed by the Eagles pretty soon. And then you have that contract stability. And even if he doesn't get re-signed by the Eagles, we know if he were to hit the open market, he would be presumably the number one tight end on the open market. It would command him a lot of money that way too. So he would have been a guy I probably would have went over LaVisca Chenault or Elijah Moore, one of the, one or the other. Um, that would be the only like, you know, gripe Bubble that I would have had with your team there. Yeah, hundred percent. So, uh, I think my whole team's 22. Wait, no, Elijah Moore's 21. Yeah, and Javante's shocked, 21. Man. Everybody on my team is 21 or 22. Wait, is Gibson's 23? Oh, senior citizen. Right. But, uh, sorry, I, did, I just find that hilarious. Ah, uh, um, that's who I was going to pick. Damn it. Oh, no. It's your yeah. boy now. You love him. No, I don't love him. I, I like him more than I did last year. That is for sure. There is one more guy on the board that, I mean, I, I'm going to basically do exactly what I wanted to happen when I made the Rashad Bateman point last time. But if Adam Thielen falls to me here, that's exactly what you want, right? I have Adam Thielen for the time being. I don't have to, ah, damn it. I knew I was going to jinx that. <laughs> um, okay. So I am going to look for more of more a winner type of receiver here, just because I have only one receiver on my roster really that I can start comfortably in week one. And my second receiver that I'm going to grab here is Robbie Anderson. I really, uh, really believe in his outlook for the next year at least. And he's still, you know, relatively young in his own right. He's like 28 years old. He should be a candidate to potentially re-sign with Carolina after this year or to go on to another team and potentially uh, find a role there. But Robbie Anderson, a lot of people don't know this. This guy was like legitimately a top 10 receiver in fantasy for the first like eight weeks of the season last year. And yeah. if Sam Darnold's able to turn around his career in any way, if he's able to become 80% of what Ryan Tannehill became in Tennessee, then his deep threat is going to be valuable. We know that Sam Darnold isn't afraid to push the ball downfield, and Robbie Anderson's going to play that primary deep threat role in the offense. Yeah, no, fully. I mean, we saw last year Robbie Anderson, it was an absolute threat when he was given the opportunity, and yeah, I, I like the pick. Right, and um, see, where we're at now is where I would have expected Burrow and Wilson and, and Jalen yes. Hurts and stuff to go. This is probably more so the range I would have liked to see those guys go if this was my own team. Because at, again, at this point, you got to weigh the receivers and the running backs that you're passing up on. Is Joe Burrow in a single quarterback league more valuable than a guy like Robbie Anderson or Adam Thielen? I mean, he definitely could be. I, I, I don't know if it's a yes or no for sure, but if you want to look at the position that way, he definitely could be more valuable than those guys. And that's what you have to weigh when you're in a one quarterback dynasty format is how much is this guy helping my team over the more uh, positions that I need to start more of week over week. Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, there's scarcity to a point, but then when you're looking at Lamar Jackson versus some fringer wide receiver two RB three type fringe spots, yes, I'm taking Lamar Jackson, lock it in my lineup, and I don't have to worry about the QB position. Yeah. All I have to do behind Lamar Jackson is probably what I'm probably going to aim to do. We're only going to go 12 rounds in this video, but if this was you know your standard 20 to 25 round dynasty super flex or um, single quarterback startup, what I would look to do is probably pair Lamar Jackson with a guy like Zach Wilson, 
a guy that I don't have to start right away who I think has a high ceiling or even pair with a guy like Trey Lance or, or Justin Fields if I wanted to go earlier at that point. But when, because I have a guy like Lamar Jackson, I don't need to do that. I can just you know punt the position essentially behind Lamar Jackson because I know if Lamar Jackson's on the field, there's not going to be very many instances that I'm not putting him in my starting lineup. Yep, absolutely. So we do see Terrace Marshall go off the board here. That was going to be my next pick, unfortunately. Um, who are you thinking here? At I'm uh, I'm going to take Will Fuller here, I think. Uh, okay. I'm looking just to make sure I don't miss anybody, but I think Will Fuller to me is the best receiver on the board. Again, I'm more of a win now team. Fuller, again, is still you know in his prime, 27 years old, 28 years old. I don't exactly know how old he is, but I imagine he's probably about that age. He's still a guy that's going to be very valuable this year. We just got uh, reports out today that the Dolphins are – looking towards going more so to a deep passing attack. I'm not sure if that's just jargon that they're saying they want Tua to push the ball down the field more, but I kind of do believe them because they did it at a very low rate last year. And bringing in the guys that they brought in, Will Fuller and Jalen Waddle, definitely suggests that they're going to go towards more so of that kind of style. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and if that's the case, I mean, we're talking about Waddle, who is one of the absolute uh, most dynamic threats in college football, both from the deep perspective, from after the catch, and then you're pairing that with Will Fuller, who was one of the best greater receivers in the league last year. Uh, if Tua can get the ball down the field, listen, he's got the adequate weapons to be able to stretch it. And uh, I'm excited, man, because I love Jalen Waddle in college. And if he's going to be used in that capacity to maximize his potential with the quarterback that he played with in college, I think we could be talking about a guy who can really produce even as soon as his rookie year. Yeah, exactly. And the Dolphins are kind of a sleeper offense too, right? Because – when you look at the landscape of the rookies last year, how many rookies had it worse than Tua Tungvaloa, right? Like not many rookies had it worse because Tua was rehabbing all off season from his hip injury. He didn't really have a chance to um, get ready for the NFL. He had to focus on being healthy so that he could be selected as high as he was because he needed to show teams that he was healthy. And obviously he showed them that he was healthy last year, but he didn't look like the same player to me that I saw at Alabama. I didn't see a scared conservative quarterback at Alabama from Tua. I saw a decisive, accurate quarterback from, from Tua at Alabama. And I think when with a full off season, it's really going to benefit him. And if he doesn't take a big step this year, I don't think he ever will because this, this first year to second year leap for him should be a big jump. In my opinion, just based on the prospect that I saw at Alabama and what I saw from him in his rookie season, I think there's a lot of meat left on the bone. And if he comes out and underperforms again this year, I think the Dolphins are going to make that decision quickly and go after a guy like Deshaun Watson next offseason. Yep, absolutely. And uh, just talk about my turn real quick. I was able to get fields. And because that wide receiver run kind of happened in front of me, um, I thought, why not take the chance on Darnell Mooney? Maybe him and uh, fields end up getting a connection. I have a nice little young stack there. Yeah, yeah, that's not a bad one too. And speaking of Deshaun Watson, I am curious about him right now. Again, I know this is a one quarterback format and I have Lamar Jackson, but when we're talking about appreciating assets, we use that term all the time. Is there a more appreciating asset than what Deshaun Watson is going to become a year from now? If Deshaun Watson is a Denver Bronco, a Miami Dolphin, a Carolina Panther, whatever team he's on, he's already, if he wasn't, if he didn't have off the field concerns, he's already a consensus top eight overall startup pick and he's being picked, you know, in the fourth round um, of, you know, super flex drafts. And then he's probably a top, you know, four round, one quarterback super flex or one quarterback startup pick, and he's going to be going here in the tenth round. So, at that point, you're getting a lot of equity back once his legal situation clears up. I don't think this is a Michael Vick situation. I don't think he's going to go to go to prison or something. I think he's probably going to settle this civilly, and it'll be behind him this time next year. Yeah, and I, I considered pairing him and Fields on that Turner, and I said, you know, I, like. uh let me just not do that in the mock. So I don't know. I, I should have, but whatever. <laughs> right. And this, to me, this is more so of a trade chip. And again, in a one quarterback format, do you really want to be trying to trade quarterbacks? Probably not. But when you have a guy that could potentially jump into that elite tier, like Deshaun Watson, he's going to have value. Even in a one quarterback league, he's still 25 years old, 26 years old. And he, when healthy should be going around the range of Kyler Murray's and Josh Allen's and Dak Prescott's. So I mean, we, we look at the receivers that went around that range. You look at guys like Keenan Allen or Brandon Ayuk or T Higgins. And if you could flip Deshaun Watson a year from now f for a, an asset of that level of value, then that's a, that's a good deal for you because you picked him in the 10th round in the startup. Yep, absolutely. So after you go with Deshaun Watson, we do see Zach Wilson and Brandon Cooks and then Jalen Rager following him up. So um, I just don't understand how Jalen Rager still has hype. 
Yeah, I mean, we've had we've had some some people in the fantasy community really go out and stress the idea of breakout age in the NFL, right? And if you guys don't know what I'm talking about in college football scouting uh, for analytics and and when we're looking at these prospects coming out from a dynasty perspective, there's a stat called breakout age. And basically what it measures is how quickly did they become a feature part of their college offense, right? Were they 18? Were they 19? Were they 20? Were they 21? Did they not do it until they were like 23, like Kadarius Tony? Um, basically what breakout age measures is how productive were they at a young age? And what we don't have is a breakout age measure for their rookie season in the NFL, because I think most people would agree that a rookie producing in the NFL is much more important than anything they could do in college. It pretty much just nullifies anything they did in college if they come into the NFL and are a stud. I'll tell yeah. you this right now. Brandon Ayuk had a terrible college profile, like a terrible one. And he came into the NFL and produced right away. And we just saw Kadarius Tony go off the board. If Kadarius Tony comes into the NFL and lights it up, we're going to have to change our tune on Kadarius Tony because rookie receivers that perform are far more likely to hit than a, uh, a player who had a good college profile. Yeah, 100%. I mean, if you need any look further, that's what Jalen Reger did as a rookie. He was the first percentile against man. He was the 14th percentile against zone, and he was the second percentile against press. And why did a team even remotely think it was a good idea to double him? I don't know. But yeah, I mean, people, okay, let me get off Twitter. People want to just go back to that profile where he was dominating at TCU and he's dominating with quote unquote poor quarterback play. And I'm sorry, Paul, I love you, but like, got to rip into the pick a little bit for the content. But I just, I can't. And it's not because I'm a Cowboys fan that I'm hating on Jalen Reger. It's because of the fact that he's not a good football player and you guys took him over Justin Jefferson. Little, little joke there. But uh, yeah, I, I, if, if it was freaking Henry Ruggs, well, actually, Henry Ruggs had a better season than Jalen Reger did last year. And people still want to hate on Henry Ruggs while loving Jalen Reger. Right. It's, it's complete bias of what people thought pre-draft, right? Cause everybody thought Henry Ruggs was overrated pre-draft and they're holding on to that stigma. People thought Brandon Ayuk was overrated pre-draft and they're holding on to that stigma. I tweeted this out earlier today, but if Jalen Rager did what Hen what uh, Brandon Ayuk did his rookie year, we'd be throwing him a freaking parade right now. And he would be a top 15 dynasty receiver. And the same factors could have applied, right? Dallas Goddard could have gotten hurt. Zach Ertz could have gotten hurt. Like everybody could have gotten hurt on the Eagles offense. And those excuses that we're making for Brandon Ayuk, oh, well, Kittle was hurt and Debo was hurt. No one would be making them for Jalen Rager. They'd be like, oh, he was, a, he just came in and performed. You'd love to see them do that than not do that, which is exactly true for Ayuk, but it doesn't hold water because people didn't like Ayuk pre-draft, but they did like Jalen Rager. So that's, that's what you got to, the, the fundamental lesson of this rant is be water, right? Like people say it all the time. You gotta, you gotta change your views on players based on what you see on the field what you see on tape, what you see in the numbers and the numbers, the film says that Jalen Rager was not good last year. And I'm not here to defend, uh, defend Henry Ruggs to no end. He wasn't, you know, necessarily what I thought he would be either. I think he can get better, but uh, he's not a sure thing either. So these guys that don't do it in their rookie years and come out and, and not like they don't perform right away. We need to take that into account when we do see guys like T Higgins, when we do see guys like Brandon Ayuk, when we do see guys like Justin Jefferson and CeeDee Lamb, who do do it right away. It's very, very predictive if you look at the numbers. Yeah, 100%. So we see on my turn there, Ryan Tannehill, I, okay, I get it. It's a one-quarterback league, but Ryan Tannehill going in the 11th round just doesn't really seem like it yeah, makes I mean, sense at I all. love Tom Brady as much as the next guy. I would not pick Tom Brady over Ryan Tannehill. It's like a 10-year age difference. Yeah, and uh, as much as I love to, I get, to be fair, he's got a young team, which got feeling mixed in there. So, um I don't know, whatever. We're about 34 minutes into this video. We'll kind of go over our own teams, wrap up the video, and you guys should be seeing this on what today? What day is it? Today, Wednesday. Honestly, I'll probably pop this out today. It's Wednesday today. Yeah, for sure. Sounds good. So, wrapping it up, last few picks, but you're back on the clock in 12.07 in about 20 seconds. Who you think? Yeah, and I didn't explain my last pick. I got Antonio Brown there. Again, more of a win now asset. He should be a wide receiver three or better this year, I would imagine. And then, of course, you have the added upside that if anything happens to Godwin, anything happens to Evans, maybe even Godwin um, moves on in free agency next year and they retain Antonio Brown, he could definitely have a little back nine to his career in Tampa Bay because he's the type of receiver that is going to age well as well. Cause he was a separator, not necessarily a speed guy. Um, I'm going to probably look to pair him with more of a younger option, a guy that could potentially increase in value. And I already have his quarterback. So I'm going to take Nico Collins here because I think Nico Collins, again, another guy that could absolutely just completely rise up the charts in value because all we can really ask for out of a young receiver is to come into the NFL and be productive, right? Just, you know, 
you have the opportunity in front of you, which Collins absolutely does. Brandon Cooks is really the only established target in that offense. If Collins comes out and has an 800 yard, you know, six touchdown rookie season with less than ideal quarterback play, for example, and Deshaun Watson stays in Houston or they draft a, a high quarterback in the draft next year, we could be talking about a number one receiver for a, a exciting young quarterback one way or another. Yeah, 100%. I mean, Nico Collins, he talked about it while he was raw. He's got all the opportunity in the world. Who does that remind you of from last year? A big, tall, fast wide receiver who maybe would have been more underdeveloped from a traditional standpoint as a pure receiver, but Chase was getting the opportunity. Bingo. We're looking at it here again, right here. Nico Collins, less than ideal quarterback playing college. He's always had the talent. He got picked in the third round. Let's see what Houston can do with him before we immediately write him off because people want to point out profiles rather than opportunities. So anyways, again, if you guys made it this far in the video, comment down below appreciating asset because we always say it. I always love it. And that is the goal of the video. And if you guys see my team on the right here, it's just straight appreciating assets, but we'll go over both of your teams. Yours being a win now contender right away. I mean, this this is a team that could probably win the championship as soon as this year. Whereas mine, I'm kind of gearing towards that 2022, 2023 type season. But take it away with yours first. Right. Yeah. So with my team, if you want to click on the top there, oh, so it just yeah, shows yeah. mine. Um, with my team, you can see that I went really like my first five picks are going to be top end assets at their position this season. And they're also still, they're not old players. None of them like Eckler, Thomas. Waller, none of them are old players. This stood, they should still be valuable two to three years from now, but they definitely have smaller windows than some of the players that you took, obviously. And I know what I'm getting with a lot of these guys. So I, I really like that start to my draft. And then with my wide receivers towards the end after Kareem Hunt, I, I kind of just mixed it up between youth and win now. I have some flexibility. If Bateman comes out and performs right away, he'll get into my starting lineup. If he doesn't, I have guys like Robbie Anderson, Will Fuller, and Antonio Brown that can fill his spot right away. And then Deshaun Watson, to me, that was a strict value pick. I only picked him because I intend on you know holding him, seeing what happens with the situation, and then potentially trading him uh, later in the uh, offseason once we have some clarity on it. Yeah, for sure. You did extremely well with your draft. And going through my team, again, started off running back, running back, running back, just smashed that hammer spot. Got Gibson and Swift on the turn, a pair of stud sophomore backs, in my opinion. Complimenting that, I do have Javante Williams at this 312. Maybe to the traditional player, might be a little bit early, but given the overall fit of my team, given the overall structure that I made, I'm willing to take that young stud running back that I believe is going to be a top 12 running back as soon as 2022 and on. You see here, five straight wide receivers, actually six out of seven picks wide receivers. This is the wide receiver honeypot. I mean, the fact that Jamar Chase, Devonta Smith, Judy, Judy uh, LaVisca Chanel, uh, Elijah Moore, and then Darnell Mooney, I absolutely love the receiving core I was able to build, all of them under the age of 22 or 22 or under. And then the two quarterbacks, Justin Fields, 9-12. I mean, he's a top 10 quarterback for me in Dynasty. The fact that I got him there was pretty ridiculous. And Ryan Tannehill, again, I just thought the value was too much. Rounding it off, I wanted Cole Komet, got sniped on that, so I ended up settling for Adam Troutman to fill up this team. Right, and in your strategy, it's good that we both kind of went in different directions, so you get a good feel for a rebuilding strategy and a win-now strategy. With your strategy, we always talk about this. We'll just repeat it in case you guys don't know. You always be looking to trade down, right? Like with the strategy that you employed where you're looking for two young picks, let's say you kept your first and second round pick. First. Exactly. Yeah. If you kept your, if you kept your first and second round pick, let's, let's say, for example, you started your draft Gibson and Swift come that three twelve. If somebody wanted to come up and get a, you know, a Kyle Pitts or a Darren Waller or something like somebody that was sliding at that point, they could have absolutely gone to you and been like, Hey, I'm going to give you my, you know, my fifth round pick and a first round pick in 2022 to come up. And then you collect those picks and you're, you're setting your team up to be a contender, you know, in the future. And the team that you have, if things break right, you could absolutely compete this year too. Like you might not win the championship, but you could be a playoff team this year. And that's where that pick of Tannehill really does help you give, uh, help you have some flexibility from that perspective. For sure. So anyways, we're nearing it on about 40 minutes. Hope you guys enjoyed this mock draft. As I said before, common appreciating assets, and we will see you guys back tomorrow for Rocky Backfields. Peace out, y'all.